I don't have a sermon this morning. That's usually the point where the congregation claps and cheers when I say that. (laughs) Instead, I, I just have a story I want to tell you. And it's a rather famous story. You could easily find it on Google where it's been used in many other sermons and churches before. Whether or not it's a true story, I have a little harder time finding because it's such a famous story. But whether or not it's historically accurate doesn't mean that there's not some truth in it that we can can bring out this morning. This is the story of Ivan the Great, the Tsar of all Russia during the 15th century. He was the Tsar that brought together warring tribes into one vast Russian empire. As a fighting man, he was courageous. As a general, he was brilliant. He drove out the Tartars and established peace across the nation. However, the story goes, Ivan was so busy waging his campaigns that he did not have a family. His friends and his advisors were quite concerned. They reminded him that there was no heir to the throne and that should anything happen to him, the union would shatter into chaos. You must take a wife who can bear you a son, they told him. The busy soldier statesman told them that he did not have time to search for a bride, but if they could find a suitable one, he would marry her. The counselors and advisors searched the capitals of Europe to find an appropriate wife for the Tsar, and find her they did. They reported to Ivan of the beautiful, dark-haired daughter of the king of Greece. She was young, she was brilliant, she was charming. He agreed to marry her sight unseen. The king of Greece was also delighted. It would align Greece in a favorable way with this emerging giant in the north. But there had to be one condition. The king of Greece said, He cannot marry my daughter unless he becomes a member of the Greek Orthodox Church. Ivan's response, I'll do it. So a priest was dispatched to Moscow to instruct Ivan in Orthodox doctrine. Ivan was a very intelligent man. He was a quick student. He learned the catechism in record time. Arrangements were concluded and the Tsar made his way to Athens accompanied by 500 of his crack troops, his personal palace guard. The plan was for him to be baptized in the Orthodox church by immersion as was the custom of the Eastern Church. And as was the custom in those days, his soldiers would be baptized along with him. Because every, as the history of England tells us, where the monarch goes in religion, there the, the, the kingdom follows. And so the patriarch of the church assigned 500 priests to give the soldiers a one-on-one catechism crash course. And the soldiers, all 500 of them, were to be immersed in one mass baptism. Crowds gathered from all over Greece to witness this. And what a sight it must have been. 500 priests and 500 soldiers, a thousand people walking into the blue water of the Mediterranean. The priests were dressed in the black robes and the tall black hats, the official dress of the Orthodox Church. The soldiers wore their battle uniforms with all their regalia, ribbons of valor, medals of courage, their weapons of battle. Suddenly, a problem arose. Why this didn't occur to anyone before, I don't know. But at that time, at that moment, the church remembered that it prohibited professional soldiers from becoming members of the church. If they wanted to commit themselves to Christ, they would have to give up their commitment to bloodshed. They could not be killers and church members too. And so there began a hasty round of diplomacy, and the problem was actually solved quite simply. As the words were spoken, and the priest began to baptize them, each soldier reached to his side and drew his sword, Lifting it high over his head, every inch of the soldier's body was baptized, except for his sword arm. The 
baptized arm. This morning, we are having our annual covenant service. This is something that is rooted deeply within the Methodist church, the teachings of John Wesley here in this country. But it's not necessarily Methodist. It's something that the URC church can participate in easily as well. Because it is quite simply a rededication of ourselves to God and to Christ. A yearly reminder of who we belong to. A yearly reminder of what we have been called to do. Now we all know that there are parts of our lives that we like to keep private from other people. Maybe there are even parts of our lives that we think that we can keep private from God. Maybe all of us have some equivalent of that unbaptized arm. The one thing that we're withholding, the one sin that we want to hold on to, the one part of our life that we refuse to truly give over. This morning, as we engage together in the back and forth words of the covenant service, I invite you to reflect upon your life, to reflect upon those things that you have given to God, and those things that you are still hesitant to give. And I invite you to come this morning completely and totally surrendering to our Lord.